In past lectures, we've seen how to do formal proofs at a relatively high level. So you use typically, you ask for induction, maybe with quite a fancy induction rule, then you just invoke general automation, and often the thing is proved. What we're going to do now is look at a very low level and see how logic is represented internally. Well, by internally, I'm not talking about data structures, I'm more talking about shall we say, conceptually. The idea of a logical framework was quite in vogue, I guess, during the 1980s when a lot of people were inventing uh, logical calculi. Uh, things like Martin Love type theory kept evolving from one version to another, and the previous versions were always anathematized and could never be mentioned again, and so on. So you need to be able to keep moving um, from one logical system to another, hence the idea that you could maybe make one single system in which lots of different logics could be represented once and for all. <coughs> uh, now this kind of went astray just as also in the 1980s a lot of people were talking about building different computer architectures and they built a lot of different architectures, but sadly, the latest Intel chip was always faster than the specialized architecture, and so all these special architectures fell by the wayside, and everyone just kept buying Intel chips you know, with the same x86 uh, um, instruction set for the next 20 or 30 years. And I guess it was similar with um, the logics, because around the mid-'80s, people gravitated to either higher order logic or some version of the calculus of constructions, and it kind of froze there. Nevertheless, it is useful, the idea of a logical framework it remains useful and interesting. And in particular, some of the, I think, nicer ways that Isabel works, in particular, arise because it's a logical framework. And the idea then, uh, even when using Isabel and staying within higher order logic, you can see your own work as developing your own logic. So as you define things, you can work in such a way that you are, you can imagine you're extending higher order logic with new definitional principles, new reasoning principles. And although in a strict sense you're not leaving higher order logic, it can feel like you're working in your own custom-made formalism. Just as if you're programming, if you know how to develop libraries in a, the right sort of way, you feel that you are building on your programming environment, making it richer and richer, and giving yourself a more and more powerful programming language, even though you're still within the same language, which may be something really lousy like C, and you're making it feel like a much more comfortable world in which to do things. So, Isabel, was one of the earliest of these. It's certainly the only one that is used as an implement, implementation of a logical framework today in any significant sense. So we have the idea of natural deduction, which you've probably seen in a discrete mathematics course, is provided in this general setting. And if you have a logical framework, Really, the pragmatic point is you implement one system and then you are able to support lots of different logics, maybe even at the same time or certainly without doing a lot of work. Now, there was the earliest work on logical frameworks were various kinds of type theories. Um, Isabel uses a much simpler foundation now, so at the lowest level, and you've seen these symbols before, so that arrow you've seen already many times in sub-goals, uh, typically to separate the induction hypotheses from the conclusion, and that funny wedge thing, which is meant to be a kind of big lambda or something, um, is a kind of universal quantification, and you've also seen it in inductive sub-goals where it binds the local variables of the sub-goal. So strictly speaking, these are the implication and the universal quantifier of the 
logic that lies on top of Isabel, and this is the meta-logic in which all the other stuff is encoded. Now, in fact, when you download Isabel, you're getting a whole bunch of different logics. Uh, this is a little out of date, but those are the most important logics provided. Um, most of them are almost never used. The constructive type theory thing there is certainly a vestige of the 80s. It is one of the banned versions of Martin Love type theory with extensional equality, so you mustn't mention it anymore. At the top, uh, left is the middle of Frankel set theory, which was recently used to formalize some forcing arguments, some very cool recent work. But the one that everybody wants is a higher order logic. So, and of course, that's what the rest of this course is about. Now, this will be a refresher on natural deduction, which I'm sure I think many of you in part three anyway, and you will have seen logic and proof of that. was about the sequent calculus. So we're not looking at sequent calculus here. But just to remind you, so in natural deduction, you work with, you have a lot of rules of inference and typically rather few axioms. And the, these rules are organized in so-called introduction and elimination rules. And crucial to natural deduction is the idea of assumptions that have a, if you like, a temporary lifetime. Um, and again, if you remember logic and proof for those of you in part three, or you may have seen elsewhere logical systems where you typically have some absolutely cryptic axioms, uh, and often the proofs are also pretty cryptic. And in those cases, the point is that it works, but no one wants to look at those proofs. Okay. And by the way, natural deduction was invented by Gerhard Genson. I never like using a word like natural because he's kind of making a claim that it really is natural, which is something for you to decide and not him. Uh, it certainly works naturally at a certain level. So let's just see what natural deduction looks like in Isabel. And I do now assume that you will have seen natural deduction elsewhere. So the rule on the, sorry, the, yeah, the inference rule on the left with P and Q above, P and Q below, is a typical introduction rule for conjunction. And there on the right-hand side, you see the Isabel version. And as you may notice, all I've done is use those fat arrows to replace the vertical bar. And there's actually a little more going on here, but I don't want to get into the details. The elimination rules for conjunction in their simplest form look like that. And again, if you write it in Isabel, all you have is you replace the line by a fat arrow. There's the other one. And this is the modus ponens rule, or implies elimination. Uh, now, here something kind of funny is going on. What do we have there? If I have P implies Q and P, then I have Q. So when you look on the right-hand side, you see there's two kinds of arrows. This often confuses or annoys beginners. They say, why have you got two kinds of arrows? Well, the fat arrow belongs to the metalogic, and it expresses the structures of inference rules. And it does other things, like it separates goals from sub-goals in a goal that you look at. And in fact, it does even more. When you look at a typical proof state that has the thing you're trying to show and the sub-goals underneath, that is one giant meta-implication. It actually has the internal form of the sub-goals, all of them together, imply the ultimate goal at the top. So that is an actual implication you're working with. And when you eventually manage to prove all of the sub-goals, what is left is the theorem itself in the form of an actual theorem. So this fat arrow is doing an awful lot of things. 
What it is not doing is it is not part of the, if you like, the object language. So when you put in a thing like this logic here, so when you assert these rules about and and implies, the, the thin arrow, you are introducing a new logic to Isabel. Now, of course, when you use Isabel Hall, they've already, it's already been done for you. So in particular, you're giving meaning to this and symbol, which does not belong to the meta logic. You're giving meaning to the implies, that is a thin arrow there, which is not in the meta logic. And basically, you might say, all you're doing is relating the thin arrow to the fat one. When maybe also it looks like it's saying, well, if P thin arrow Q, then P fat arrow Q, which seems kind of redundant. Um, as I said, there's a little bit more going on there that makes it slightly less trivial than it appears. Nevertheless, you could have your own object logic that did not even have an implied symbol of its own. And you would have to get by, you still, because you have the fat arrow, which is part of the meta logic, you could still do quite a lot of stuff. So let's talk about this. I've already probably said everything on the slide. Um, by the way, the thing that you make with equal signs and greater than sign is what you used to have to type in the bad old days, and you can still type it, and it will be converted into a fat arrow for you. But this is, of course, the meta logic implication. So I've said this, and I said that. So you can have your own implies. Um, and of course, in this case, this implied symbol is kind of the same as the meta one in terms of how it behaves logically. But you could also have something like linear logic in which you have a notion of implication which behaves weirdly, except that I can't stand linear logic. But that is not part of the syllabus. Oh, another thing, uh, this is maybe a relic, but I find using the notation with the fat brackets is, in my own opinion, a lot neater than having a lot of nested arrows. So these two are completely equivalent. Um, now don't be shocked if you see that in certain places. Now, I'm going to demonstrate this by going through some proofs. And the point is, there are two things going on here. One is to show you how it works. But the other is to show you how to prove a theorem when it turns out induction in auto doesn't do it for you. Because if you're trying to prove something hard, and maybe induction has not got any role to play, um, then you will typically have to use other theorems proved already and find a clever way to combine the use of those other theorems in such a way as to prove the thing you want to do. And to do that, you need to refer to that particular theorem and say, use this theorem here to reduce my goal to subgoals. And for that, you use the thing there called rule, which is the most basic way of applying a rule of inference backwards to reduce a goal to subgoals. So the thing we're trying to prove here, I don't know if you can see it from there, but I hope you all have your printed notes as well. Um, it says, if I know P, and if I know P implies Q, that's a meta implies, sorry, that's a, not a meta, it's a thin arrow, then I know P and Q. Okay, that's pretty obvious, and normally you would just type by auto and be done with it. And in fact, if you look carefully, you see the blue dot? You should never ignore a blue dot, because it's usually got very important information for you. So if you clicked on the blue dot, it would actually say by auto. In other words, it would say, what are you doing this for, you idiot? We can do it automatically. But we ignore the blue dot here because we're going to do it in slow motion. So rule is the proof method which can take, in this case, a single named rule. That's conjunction and introduction. Or you can give it a list of rules, and it will just try them in order until one of them is successful. And in fact, you can even backtrack over the choice. So if you know what you're doing, you can set up some very cool searches by uh, trying a string of different rules, perhaps, and combining them with other things. So you can make some very quite cool proof procedures there just by uh, using the built-in backtracking, which is also part of Isabel. So in this case, I apply conjunction introduction to the conclusion there. 
and we get two sub-goals. Now, if you see the two sub-goals are the same assumptions, but now one of them concludes with P and the other concludes with Q. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see the sub-goal number one has a P on the left side and P on the right side. Uh, and we can use the assumption um, rule method to prove it. Now, when we do that, so I have to say, apply assumption. Bingo, it goes away. So remember, the, there's always a sub-goal one. So in this case, we proved the previous sub-goal one. So now they were shuffled up, renumbered. And now the other thing is sub-goal one. Uh, we can continue slightly unnaturally here and say, we're not done yet. We have the assumption P. The assumption P implies Q. And we need to show Q. Well, um, at the moment, we only know about rules. So we can only do this in a fairly clunky way. We are um, going to try and reason backwards with the modus ponens rule. And that will do this for us. Uh, can you read that? It says we have now two sub-goals again. And then what this question mark P3 implies Q. And also, you have to show question mark P3. Now, what, what was that? It's very simple. We said prove Q using the modus ponens rule. The modus ponens rule says, well, if you want to prove Q, find something that implies Q, prove that something, and then you've got Q. So this question mark P3 is the something that we need to uh, imply Q. So if we can prove both sub-goals, and it doesn't matter what question mark P3 is, although obviously it needs to be the same in both sub-goals, then we'll be done. Uh, now, as I told you before, anything with a question mark in front is unifiable. That means it can be, you can substitute other things into it. And in this case, it's pretty obvious that if only I put P in, I've replaced that thing by simply P, then both those things will be true by assumption. So what we do is we say, well, just apply assumption. And what, is, what the assumption method will do here is doesn't need an exact match. It asks, is, can I do it by unification? Can I unify that conclusion, which has variables in it, that is question mark P3, can I unify it with an assumption? And, um, sorry, I said that. I kind of said that. So I, if I, placeholder is an, another word for a unifiable variable here. Um, if I can prove those things, then I'll be finished. Now, actually, I want to make a little remark just now. You might think proof by assumption is trivial, so why do we even bother with it? And why do I have the proof method for it at all? Why don't we just delete them immediately and just do the assumption? But maybe the, the answer to that question is evident to you now because, okay, this case is trivial, but in a less trivial case, you might have some choices there. So you have question mark P3 has to be P in this example, but what if there were two different things that implied Q and maybe only one of them would work? So the decision to do proof by assumption is a non-trivial choice. So when you're working at this kind of super low level, you have got to um, apply the assumption method yourself if you want to do it. Now, let's just see how this works. So these placeholders, these assumptions, uh, here I applied assumption and just said, okay, sub-goal one disappeared. Uh, and what happened there in the other goal? It changed the question mark to P3. So remember, uh, and if, again, those of you, who, if maybe you've done my own logic and proof or some other course about uh, automated proof and unification, what happens in unification is not just that you match things up, but you remember 
how you match things up. You said, I set this variable to P, and you do that assignment everywhere. That's necessary, otherwise it will not make any sense. So I set that variable, question mark P3, I set it to P, and the effect is now visible globally. So the other instance has turned into P, and now it's obvious that when we call the assumption a method for a second time, uh, there will be no subgoals left, and we'll have proved our theorem. Taking us to Dilbert number one, and this is a very inspiring one. You know, you just a question about the Dilbert? No, no, about the previous one. Yes. Time. So uh, you said that we need to have this assumption uh, tactic or yes. Yes, so that we can decide uh, which assumption to use, but we didn't specify which assumption to use. How would we do that if there were two implications that imply P? Well, backtracking is naturally in the framework. Um, now, I'm not saying a lot about backtracking in the course, but you can combine um, there are ways of combining things, of putting them in parentheses uh, so that you have alternatives and you can have repetition. Um, now, in fact, there is even a back command at top level which basically says it's the equivalent in prologue of pressing semicolon if you know it, you know how to interact with the prologue top level. It's the equivalent of saying, I don't like what you just did, do it another way. Um, now, I don't want to see any of those in the final piece of work you hand in but it's very useful to try and figure out uh, how to do it. So yeah, backtracking is in the uh, low level. The way it got in there, incidentally, is that um, all of these proof methods that take a particular proof state and give you further proof states are generating a, in fact, potentially infinite sequence of proof states. So the backtracking involves simply discarding the head of this sequence and going to the next one. In fact, you can even backtrack over unifiers because this is higher order unification and you can have multiple unifiers as well. Uh, if you're doing that, you're kind of going into dark magic. So don't do it too quickly. Okay, let's move on. Um, some inference rules involve assumptions, and the quintessential example is implies introduction. So the way you introduce something of the form P implies Q is that you assume P, you derive from it somehow Q, and of course the dots there in that rule that you see on the left are meant to be filled in eventually by some gigantic proof of Q. Now, that is formalized in Isabel by the thing on the right there. A more complicated example is the or elimination rule, which you would, could type into Isabel using that. And incidentally, back when we really emphasized the logical framework side of things, the point was that you really could set up a little bit of stuff for your syntax using some, a little bit of code, and then literally type in the rules of inference that you wanted your logic to have, just like that, and bingo, you had an implementation already. So it wasn't a very sophisticated implementation, but it would have all your rules of inference, plus the basic framework, which included, as I said, things like backtracking, so you could do some uh, automatic, automated search of just like that, from the get-go. Now here is, we're going to introduce a new proof method here to do something a little more naturally. So you see what we're trying to prove is, uh, if, uh, if we're trying to prove P or P implies P, which is of course trivial again, but never mind, let's do it. Um, Note that's a thin 
arrow, so there are no assumptions yet. That is just an implication. But when we use rule imp i to apply, apply implies introduction, now we've got a fat arrow. So what we have done, it has, if you like, it has reduced the thin arrow, which is, if you like, the higher order logic implies symbol. It has reduced it to the meta implies symbol. Anyway, now we have P or P as an assumption, and this is exactly how we use imply, how we use implies introduction in natural deduction, that to show P implies Q, we assume P and show Q. So here we're assuming P or P, and now our task is to show Q. Um, now we have got a new proof method called E rule. It's shown that you see it in the third line at the top. E rule, the E is for elimination, and it's a proof method that's designed for elimination rules. Now, this is, I think, easier to get if you're familiar with the sequent calculus. And what we're trying to do is kind of fake a sequent calculus from natural deduction. Because the point is, when you have any disjunction, like here P or P, I have the right, or it gives you the right, to do a case analysis on either side of it being true. And once you've done that case analysis, the disjunction itself is redundant. So um, if I assume that P is true, I don't need P or P anymore. So what is really useful is something that will use the rule and throw it away immediately. So that's what we're going to do. So E rule will find something that matches uh, this disjunction elimination rule. So it will actually look for something that matches the first premise of the rule, and then it will delete the matching assumption. So having applied the rule, you see the disjunction has disappeared, and, and what's left is trivial. So, uh, so any elimination rule from the, in the natural deduction kind of formulation of any logic, you should probably want to use E rule there. And you see now, um, it has automatically matched the first a premise of the disjunction elimination rule, which would define any disjunction, and it replaced it by the obvious disjunction, which is there in our goal, and now the rest will be trivial. Ah, I did a tiny little extra thing here, so I need the assumption rule, the assumption method twice, uh, and there I used plus as a modifier of the method which does one or more applications. Okay, making progress. You can think of this one when you're trying to do your assignments for this course. Okay, what about quantifiers? Quantifiers make it all much, much harder. In fact, quantifiers have always made it much harder. Way back in the time of the Boyer and Moore theorem prover, which is a classic, I mean, it's funny that this is like part of the history of AI, they just didn't have quantifiers because quantifiers just messed things up too much. But you can't do without quantifiers, so let's have them. Um, so exists introduction. On the left, you have the typical natural deduction rule, which says if I have some formula P uh, and some term T, and if P holds for a particular term, then I can, uh, I can conclude there exists X such a P of X. And of course, it's obvious, right? The thing that I'm claiming to exist is right there, and it's T. Uh, yes? Should it be P of T on the right hand side instead of P of V? Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. <clears throat> um, sticking to the left hand side still, 
there's some syntactic cleverness there because P, if that were in a book, they would probably mumble something about how P represents the context in which maybe all occurrences of X below are replaced by T above. Or if you remember logic and proof, for those of you who are in part three and did my course, uh, one might write it differently and have um, an explicit substitution operator to say that I want to replace X by T in P. Um, but we have the luxury of a higher order formalism, so the thing that's underneath in this uh, logical framework of ours is higher order logic. And now on the right hand side, P is literally a variable of a function type, and this variable can represent any dependence on the argument. And that, in fact, when we go through the syntactic mechanisms, it will allow any formula in which there is a dependence on a thing to be extract, uh, abstracted in the right way. Now, why is that x instead of t? Um, I don't exactly remember now. In fact, the thing is, it doesn't matter what it is because there can be no a logical clash between the x on the very far right there because that's a bound variable, whereas the other x is a free variable. There is some trickery in Isabel to try and present the user with nice looking variable names when they work. And I think it has something to do with that. So when you match a free variable name with the bound variable name, it is a hint to Isabel as to what variable name it should choose when it has to invent them. So this has no logical import whatever, but people get tired of variables called x123 very quickly. So we try and, and choose the same variable names as you had. Um, this rule, and again, I hope you've seen this before, because if not, it will be pretty mystifying. But that is the, on the left, bottom left, there is the standard uh, natural deduction rule for existential elimination. So if I know that for some x, p of x, then I am allowed to discharge an assumption of the form p of x, provided x is not free in the conclusion, and that complicated business can be coded as shown on the bottom right there. Again, P, because of our higher order framework, will naturally allow any, any kind of formula context in which X occurs. Um, moreover, when you look at, you see the second, I wish I had a pointer, but the thing, the second thing in the brackets, the thing that implies Q, it has a metaphor all X, P of X implies Q. And I don't have to say that X doesn't occur in Q because if you look at it, X does not occur in Q. And by the normal um, scope rules for the lambda calculus, it will be impossible to plug in to, it will be impossible to replace Q by anything that has a free occurrence of X. So variable capture cannot happen here because the framework itself is based on the lambda calculus. There's an awful lot of detail here which I'm concealing from you. Uh, and if you really wanted to learn it all, there are plenty of papers you can read. But there's only so much one can fit in the course. Um, <clears throat> okay, I kind of said that. Right, so you see the, the x, the freshness of the variable x here is being expressed by that meta-universal quantifier. So now let's look at a proof. And incidentally, you can test your knowledge of any logical formalism or test the correctness of any theorem-proving code you have written by going through very simple proofs involving quantifiers such as this one. So what does this say? The assumption is for some x, p of fx and q of x. The conclusion is simply there exists x, p of x. Well, that's obviously true. In fact, the blue dot is saying, by auto guy, 
Um, but we're going to go through it. We're going to use our E rule method because we're going to use, we have two elimination rules we have to do. First, we're going to have to, what's on the outside? Exists X is on the outside, so I have to eliminate the existential quantifier first. Then we'll eliminate the conjunction symbol. So let's see how that goes. So remember, E rule will find something that matches the elimination rule and delete it. And when we apply it, doesn't seem to have happened yet there. There, it happened. So you see the existential quantifier went away and it was replaced by its meta for all in that new sub goal one. Now we need to do the, okay, I labeled that. Now we need to do the conjunction elimination. Now I should mention, because I showed you on a previous slide, we had little, we had uh, conjunction elimination rules that take P and Q to P and P and Q to Q. Those aren't very useful with um, E rule because what you want here is a thing that looks for P and Q and then gives you both P and Q available separately. So that is a thing called conj E and when we apply that rule, so I haven't shown you this thing, I've just described it to you. When I apply this rule with E rule, all it will do is get rid of the and symbol and give us both of the things inside, although I only need one of them. So it will give us both of them. So you see the and has turned into a semicolon. So this is using the fat brackets. By the way, by default, Isabel will not show you the fat brackets. And if you, uh, like me, prefer the fat brackets to having nested arrows, go to the course website where it tells you how to do the little bit of black magic necessary to uh, see this. So we have applied E rule twice, and now what we have got is um, P of fx as an assumption. Now we should be pretty close to our goal. On the right hand side, of course, we have exists x p of x, and now it's time to apply rule. Uh, what's going to happen now? Here we're going to see a classic case of why we want logical variables or unifiable variables in our logical framework and in our theorem prover, simply because when I want to show exists x p of x, I can't be sure that I will know what x should be, what the, what the witness should actually be. And there are quite a few theorem provers in use where you have to already know, so you have to say eliminate the existential quantifier and plug in zero or f of a plus blah, 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 and have it exactly right. It is much nicer when you have the possibility of leaving it unknown until you can figure out what it should be. So here, here we have a thing called, I'm sorry, it's called question mark x4, which is not the most beautiful name, but it could be worse, I guess, uh, applied to x. And we need unification here. Uh, which the assumption method will do for us. Now, there is an awful lot here that I haven't told you about that I couldn't realistically tell you about. Um, some of it, it says here, I haven't mentioned universal quantifiers at all, but of course they're there. You've actually seen the harder case with existential quantifiers, but all of the same principles apply. Um, now I've mentioned higher order unification before. I haven't really said what it is, however. Point is when you have a higher order framework where you have a thing like P, which just by, it will have a type in the system which tells you that it depends, it actually expects to be applied to effectively a term, 
And now you say, I want to unify P with some big expression over there. It actually has to match P against the expression and find any way or every way in which that expression can be written as this function variable P applied to the argument, which may be something specific like zero, or maybe is also a variable, in which case you have an enormous amount of degrees of freedom here. So that's what higher order unification is. It's actually undecidable in general. You can, in bad cases, get infinitely many unifiers. Um, it's not a thing you have to think about, right? It isn't all just do it. Um, and if you're lucky, it will do the natural thing. If you're unlucky, you might see things like messages saying unification bound exceeded, in which case you probably should try a different approach. Um, so there's an awful lot of cool stuff going on uh, underneath, which if you're interested, there are kind of the early papers on Isabel explain a lot of those things. Also, I should mention that I've shown you how the rules of natural deduction look when you type them in, simply that they look similar. But to know that this similarity is not an illusion, that they really are logically equivalent, has to be proved, um, not by you, it was proved by me in something like 1989. Um, and in fact, so, so the, this is in fact uh, an authentic, if that is the right word, an accurate implementation of logic here. Um, but the last thing, just to remind you again, rule especially, I think you won't be using E rule very often, but rule you will need to use whenever you have a particular thing that applies to what you're trying to prove and where it can't be done automatically. This is a thing that I know that there are a few students who will just the moment auto fails, might just kind of give up. But the thing is, uh, typically the thing you're trying to prove, there will be lemmas relating to the thing that you're interested in. And you can try and apply them in a single step using rule and see if what you get is simpler than what you had before.